It's wonderful to be here. Um, I really like the idea of the Delta project. It's kudos to you. It's, it's a great idea. Uh, I've been a part of a lot of big conferences, and, and what you said at the beginning is, is exactly what happens. Is you, know, you listen to some great, inspiring speakers and hardly engage with each other in the way you wish you could, and then it's over and you're trying to remember what you trying to take away from it. It's, it's a, a wonderful concept. Um, I also really uh, am inspired by the idea of what colleges can do in this world and should be doing in this world. Um, it, what I was trying to think about as I came up is, you know, what other institutions do we have that can think hundreds of years into the future and that should think hundreds of years into the future. It, it's certainly not our corporate world. Um, it, you know, it just simply has to be our educational institutions. And how else are we going to build a better world if it doesn't happen on college campuses? Um, most of our work is with uh, it, with the residential world and you know we're out there trying to convince our customers if they haven't convinced us that they ought to be thinking you know 30 or 40 or 50 years in the future and that really you know sustainability is about building a better planet not just you know building a good investment for yourselves over a 10 or 20 year period so uh, this this is where uh, a better world should be created. Um, my uh, history in building does come from timber framing. Um, I got started in timber framing because I saw it as a potentially better way to make buildings. And I was inspired by the idea that we all have here in New England that you can walk into a building that's 250 years old there are many of them right around here, and realize that that building has served generations of people. It is still there. It is still useful. It is still, you know, giving good service. And we look at that building, and, and at the heart of it is a timber frame. When that timber frame building comes down, almost always, the structure of the building will be salvaged for new buildings. In fact, when you go into an old timber frame, uh, including ones I've seen in Europe that are 500 years old, if you're looking carefully at that timber frame, because those builders were so frugal, almost always you'll find that some of those timbers came from earlier buildings also happens with the barns. When you look at an old barn, if you look carefully, almost always you'll find braces or struts or small pieces that clearly came from a building before it. So timber framing has always inspired me. It's been wonderful to be a part of it. Over all the years that we've been doing it, our goal has been to develop a building system as robust, as sustainable, as durable as the heart of it, which was that timber frame. The rest of it has been the challenge, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> I stopped doing research in this country on building, uh, on building technology in the late 1980s. Really, in fact, to be honest with you, there's not much good going on in America in building technology. And when you go over to Europe, Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, even if you go to Japan, it's a little embarrassing that we're so far behind. And so my research for the past 20 years has been overseas and the intent has been to try to bring technology, ideas, systems, 
back to this country that we can deploy today. So <clears throat> a lot of what I'm talking about today um, comes from a Dutch architect whose name is John Habrocken, the open building concept. And then a lot of the technology comes from builders um, and architects who I've come to know very well, in, especially in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and, and uh, France. <clears throat> um, so here it is. This is kind of the basic idea that I want to get across. Um, we think of our buildings as one thing, but they're really a whole lot of things going on in a building. And the real problem in good design and good construction and good durability and good sustainability is that we have a crisis of entanglement in our buildings. We've added technology, we've added systems, we've added layers of things over the last 150 years, but we're not making them any differently. And therefore, and I'm just going to take a guess, behind the walls right around you, there's an infrastructure that is inaccessible because we've buried pipes, wires, high voltage, low voltage, in a place where we can't get to them. And we've installed them in a way that is chaotic. Therefore, you don't even know where they are. So if you want to change wires or pipes, high voltage or low voltage, you're going to have to do some demolition here. And there's a part of this building that ought to last a very long time, ought to last 200 years or 300 years. And if we think less than that, what the hell is sustainable? And we've embedded that with stuff that we know won't last 10 years. What's the sense of it? And so open building theory says, look, we've got to separate this stuff. We've got the 500-year stuff. We've got 200-year stuff. We've got generational stuff. And we know what it is. But we link it all together as if it's one thing. And we don't do a good job of disentangling that building, reorganizing it, designing it differently so that <clears throat> we can think about it and build it and therefore renovate it in a completely different, more sustainable way. <clears throat> so when you get into open building theory, what happens is you have the long-term proposition, which is a building envelope, also, which has its layers. And then you have the infill, which is how the building is used, which has a shorter lifespan that really ought to be separated from each other and the layers of which ought to be distinguished from each other and all of it that ought to be accessible now and in the future. So as we go about thinking about how we do this, our challenge as designers and builders in our, in our little enterprise in New Hampshire has been, OK, we get it. Now, how do we do it? How do we separate you know, structure from infill and the layers from each other? And then how do we make all of that accessible? So the challenge has been to say, well, here's a frame. Here's a skin. These are long-term elements. And then we have to think about ways to design into our buildings places for wires, high voltage, places for wires that are low voltage, places for mechanical systems that we know are going to need to be replaced or upgraded. And we have to find a way to make those layers separated from each other and accessible for first installation, and for future renovation. The other way to think about this open building concept is <clears throat> what I call the theater and the stage. The concept is 
that we're, we're, all of our buildings are essentially the theater. The stage is what goes on inside of them. And clearly, when you do that in reality, you know that there are going to be many plays and many different acts in every play. And so the theater is designed to separate the structure into which the play happens, or the plays, from the stage where you know there's going to be a churn of activity. And therefore, that theater part can live on for multiple generations and hardly be changed at all, while the stage itself is designed to constantly churn and be reinvigorated. So structure and infill, that's one way to think about it. Theater and stage gives it kind of a, <clears throat> another um, uh, terminology. So <clears throat> shell and infill, if we can separate them, you know, certain things happen. One is that we have the impact of the shell ought to be public, there's public control, there's the long-term durability, there's sustainability, and the players generally need to be architects, engineers, and, and the public agencies. Infill, and this is especially true in the uh, president side, is really where, you know, we ha it's private, there's individual expression, and the intent should be easy change. It should be designed for change. What happens now is when people really want to make a change in their home, they sell it and move. Because change is too hard. And too much demolition is required to get, you know, two bedrooms over there because grandmother's moving in. Actually, we've made that so difficult to do and so expensive to do that people just abandon homes that are perfectly good and should be perfectly adaptable only because change is so difficult. And when that happens at the institutional level, well, I think that's unforgivable because clearly we know that technology is going to change for a room like this and you shouldn't have to do demolition and take stuff off to the landfill when you could have easily predicted that that change was going to happen. So shell and infill, two different things going on. Really, we have to change that process. And when we think about it, it's really the key. It's the key to making high-performance buildings. And it's something that I argue a lot about uh, with lead practitioners because I think it's pretty silly, you know, to commission a building um, when part of it is a 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 year proposition that ought to be high performance, ought to be really net zero, every one of them. And at the same time, you're analyzing equipment that probably isn't going to last five years or 10 years. And they're all a part of the same sustainability formula. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference because really what we, we need to be looking at is how do you not compromise that building shell, that part that's going to live with the public for a very long period of time, that part that's going to have energy consequences for a very long period of time. How do we separate these two elements so that even some of the infrastructure equipment that's inside the building really should be thought of as a more short-term proposition? But too often, on the budget side, you know, the shell of the building is compromised for the infill elements of the building. And again, you know, that happens with our clients a lot, building homes. But, you know, I point to this again and again and say, you know, why don't we just make it pretty good for now <laughs> instead of perfect? Why don't you cut back on some of the amenities because we can install them at any time at all and not compromise the building shell? 
But in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was hard to convince our clients of that. Today it's not. And our clients are demanding high performance shells and they're willing to cut back on the infill because we really can create a building where that can and accrue over time. So that's a little bit about open building. <clears throat> um, now I want to get to some other parts that have been outgrowths of that. One is we apply a 3D grid to all the buildings that we design and build. It just makes a ton of sense. Because by doing this, design is easier, engineering is easier, and we're still able to make you know, very custom buildings. Just as, as a child, you never duplicated your Lego projects as architects and engineers, we don't duplicate our buildings, we just put them on a grid. And that allows the design to happen very rapidly. Uh, there's a lot of flex to it. But it also means, as you'll see, if we design on this 3D grid, what happens is everything we design can be used again. Whether it's a bathroom, an entry sequence, a stairway, um, a bedroom sequence, it all it goes into a library and therefore out of that library we end up with a whole bunch of components, whether they're 3D components or 2D components that we can pull from the library and put into any design we do only because we started with a grid. And having done it now for about 18 years, uh, the library is pretty rich and deep, and we can develop designs and engineering solutions without starting from scratch. But every building is custom. We didn't invent the idea. It goes back 2,000 years. Palladio did it long before we did. He had a library of patterns, styles, parts, pieces, and we all think he did a pretty good job of making some wonderful, uh, wonderful buildings. We do the same thing. Hello, next slide. We're stuck on Palladio. <laughs> it's probably a good way to leave it. <laughs> Let's try. The next class, come on up. <laughs> the next slide shows the same kit apart, so there we go. All you gotta do is get close. <laughs> you scared it. <laughs> so here's our kit apart. It's the same thing as Palladio's, except our, ours resides in a computer uh, software system that we have. Um, it's tens of thousands of parts and pieces deep. We can distill these library parts and pieces into smaller families, as we call them, or matri matrices, and put them into groups that allows us to customize particular designs on behalf of our clients. We're doing a lot of homes these days for $250,000 and less. And we're trying to make those homes high-performance homes, custom homes that respond to site, rep respond to their need, respond in very particular ways to the requirements of that particular family. That's a difficult task. But by using a matrices like this, all of the library components are done. They're complete. And we bring them together, we assemble them together in a automated way, allowing us to meet those small budgets, still build high performance buildings, and still do it in a custom way that responds to need and site. Therefore, the designs are kind of compositions as opposed to uh, custom one-of-a-kind buildings or compositions of parts that we have pre-established and pre-designed. The result is that if we're using 100% out of our library, we have this very low uh, cost point that we can achieve. 
The key to all of that is BIM at a very high level, software that is very, very, very robust and allows us to pre-build buildings in fine detail before they are actually built. We know where the bolts are. We know where the screws are. And they have been put in there by our engineers. And they are in the model. And when we go to build it, we simply repeat what we've already done, as opposed to going out and making a building for the first time. That allows us to actually apply product lifestyle or life cycle management to buildings. All other industries have been doing this for a long time. This is an old idea uh, that the auto industry developed back in the 40s and 50s. And most other industries have adopted product life cycle management as a part of their operations, where you're thinking about how you conceive it, how you design it, how you make it, how you service it, and how you bring it back to the beginning, cradle to cradle. You can actually do that if you can think about your buildings in a virtual way before you make them. We can also go from BIM, which is the building information model, directly to CNC. All other industries are doing this. The building as an industry has been slow to do it, but it makes so much sense. It may, you know, I have some of the best craftsmen in the Northeast working in our company. Really, really talented woodworkers, timber framers, building systems specialists. None of them like to be on a chop box with a measuring tape and a fat pencil. That is not craft. It has nothing to do with craft. Craft is something else. Our machine can do what, I don't know, what the slaves used to do. <laughs> Our machine can do the really dumb work. And it does it very, very accurately, very, very fast. And it really you know, allows our craftsmen to uh, elevate their craft to the highest level. Um, <clears throat> so. This makes a ton of sense. This machine on the right has an optimizer in it so that when we feed in the information for a building or two buildings, it not, doesn't just cut the pieces and mark them and label them. It also optimizes so that we get the least amount of waste out of the stock that is presented to the machine. The company that makes the machine calls that particular software a board stretcher because if you get enough information going in, you'll actually get more length coming out that went, than went into it because it can nest angles. <clears throat> and by nesting angles, which there are typically a lot of in building, and you have enough parts and pieces, you end up with a little bit of waste but more length than went in. So it's remarkable and good technology. So we make modular components as a company. We do not make modular buildings. We make the stuff that's in our library. And then having created it virtually, we make it um, <clears throat> you know, actually and take it to the site. Sometimes it's a pod, like this bathroom and mechanical pod. But usually they are flat elements, like walls, floors, roof elements. And then we take them to the site and assemble them. It seems like maybe a little bit of a radical idea. It's not modular. On the other hand, the building industry has been doing it for a long time. And they never call it prefab when you are doing cabinets. You don't say prefab cabinets. You don't say prefab doors. Um, you don't say prefab windows. There will be a time when most buildings will be made off-site because all parts, including Walls, <clears throat> floors, roof elements are also made off-site in the way that <clears throat> other elements already are. So what's the benefit of that? Lean production. We now can bring lean production systems into the making of construction elements. Again, 
All other industries have been doing it for a long time. What's the idea? To eliminate waste. That's it. To eliminate waste in movements, waste of materials, waste in processes. And a company like ours, because we practice you know, lean, can work on ideas and systems that simply eliminate waste of all kinds. Anything that drops off of the end of a saw, moves downstream to the next project, or ends up heating our facilities um, as uh, heat, heat waste. So here's our, our uh, wall elements in production. The other <clears throat> concept here then is if we're making parts and pieces in that way is to take 50,000 pieces and reduce them to 50. It's not modular building, it's modular parts, and then the parts can then go into buildings that are very, very custom. And then the other outgrowth of that is site is a terrible place to create construction efficiency. It's just hard. Weather problems, coordination problems, training problems, I could get into a whole lot more, but we can control all of that offsite, and if we use a site for assembly, then we can control that efficiency at a very high level. Final principle here is the master builder era is gone. You've got to uh, use the whole team from the beginning. At the BIM level, everybody needs to get involved. In our company, even the craftsmen get involved with the BIM and review the building at the BIM level, at the virtual level. And when it's made, everyone agrees, it's done, let's go build it. And that's where the craft happens. Building is a noble profession. We've taken that idea away in this country and we've reduced it to something else. And it's something that I will spend all of my days fighting against because at root, I'm a carpenter. And what got me into the building trades is carpentry and building and the satisfaction of making something with your hands and seeing it rise into the air. And we in this country, for whatever reason, have made it the place that people go when they failed at everything else in life. And we think of the construction trades in an embarrassing way. And it's wrong. So it is really important in our, all of the things that we do that we make great jobs in building. And it means better discipline, better training, better organization, better use of human skills, better demand, and better compensation. Out of all of that is this. The open build standard is highest quality architecture, craftsmanship, bringing in technology, innovative building systems to make high performance buildings, shell, that will last 500 years. Why not 500 years? And having done all of that, to do it in an affordable, durable, and beautiful way. So here's my example, um, and I need to credit Mitch Tomasha over here. Uh, Mitch is the president of Unity College, and this is Mitch's vision. Mitch came to us asking for a new president's house for Unity College. And he said, Ted, you know, what we believe in is sustainability. What we want our kids to believe in and invest their lives in is sustainability. And we need to make a building on ca our campus that will demonstrate those values. And that building needs to be the building I will live in. And to show our commitment, that building also needs to be a classroom because I want our kids to see it and experience it and it also needs to be able to be our boardroom.
because I need our board to be invested in it too. And Ted, that building needs to accommodate a larger family than mine, so we need to plan it for three or four bedrooms. It needs to flex to be a classroom. It needs to flex again to be a boardroom, and it can't be over 2,000 square feet because if it is, it's not sustainable. Well, thank you, Mitch. <laughs> There's a challenge. And, um, and it has to be lead platinum and net zero. So <clears throat> we were the servants. <laughs> Mitch made the call. And I am so proud um, of this as being the only work to date that we've done on a college campus. But it is our proudest project um, for the high demand that Mitch set for us on this building. I won't go through all the <clears throat> parts and pieces. I want you to talk to Mitch, who can speak more eloquently about it. He lives there. We built it. But there's a virtual um, model of this movable partition that made part of it possible. We also have a demountable set of partitions. We have a panelized ceiling system that allows this accessibility that I talked about. All the mechanics of this building are disentangled and accessible, just as I talked about in the beginning. We separated the mechanical system as a bar um, on one side of the building and then developed the living side of the building um, toward the sun. Pretty simple. But it's a wonderful party that we've discovered is very, very flexible and can be used in a lot of different ways. On this particular project, it allowed us to make modules for the mechanical systems and then walls and roof panels for the other parts. So here are the wall, wall panels in production, the module in production, our wonderful controlled conditions, a floor. Uh, actually, that's a, a ceiling system packed with cellulose. Um, flat pack shipping. We don't waste when we ship things. Uh, we think we're actually upping the ante of what can be achieved with uh, shipping because Always, things are shipped to the building site. That, that hasn't changed. We ship complete elements to the building site. And the way we pack them on the truck is computerized also and optimized also. Site assembly, therefore, happens very quickly. After five days, you have an enclosed shell. And <clears throat> not long after that, the infill, the computer model on the left, the building on the right the wonderful um, furniture uh, supplied by Green Design in Portland, our cool ceiling system, and I think, you know, a model of sustainability, durability, and maybe the kind of thing that many college campuses can do in the future. Thank you. <laughs>